In a previous video, I introduced semantic caching and explained how it can help you reduce your OpenAI API bill and improve the speed of your AI application. But it can be challenging to evaluate and configure for your specific use case. So in this video, we are going to build a web application to populate a cache and visualize the results so you can determine the best similarity threshold for your application. Let's go! Caching is like a high-speed storage layer storing frequently used data, like results from complex computations, database searches, or pricey API retrievals. Think of it as a key value store. The keys are your requests, and the values contain the resulting data. However, traditional caching is too simple, as your queries need to match exactly the key in the cache to get the stored data as a result. But it's not enough for AI application using large language models like GPT-4 as two sentences will not be exactly equal, but might be semantically equivalent. Semantic caching can determine if two prompts have the same meaning, even though they are not textually equal. And if a result is already present in the cache, it will return it directly, saving the time and money to make another API call. Imagine the following scenario. Suppose two questions. What is AI and how does AI work? have been asked and answered by GPT-4. Those questions, along with their answers, are now stored in our cache. Fast forward to a new user asking, can you define the concept of AI? Normally, this would require another round of querying GPT-4, costing time and money. But thanks to our cache, it recognizes that the question closely matches what is AI. Instead of repeating the costly query process, the cache promptly gets the answer it has stored saving you both time and expenses. And that's super useful. But how can the semantic cache determine if two prompts are semantically equal? It uses a similarity or distance metric between the two embeddings. The similarity or distance function returns a score. The highest the score, the most similar are the embeddings if you use similarity. If you use the distance function, it's the opposite. But you need to determine a threshold above which you consider two prompts to be equivalent. And unfortunately, it's not that obvious without practical experimentation. So I built a simple web application using Streamlit to fill a cache with some entries and visualize the similarity score with a new prompt. It uses two methods to compute the embeddings. OneNX that downloads and uses the Paraphrase Albert model and OpenAI that uses the OpenAI embeddings. On the left-hand side, we add three questions to the cache. What is AI? Who invented AI? And how does AI work? For each question, the cache computes and stores the embeddings. Then, on the right side, we can write prompts. It will compute the embedding and return a ranking from the most similar to the less similar elements in the cache. First, we try the question, can you define AI? As a result, we get the ranking with the Onenix embeddings and the OpenAI ones. As expected, the question is most similar to what is AI. Then we prompt, describe the functioning of AI. Now, the most similar element in the cache is how does AI work, as we could expect. And finally, asking do you know the inventor of AI returns as the most similar element who invented AI. It looks good and makes sense for those examples, but sometimes it might be off, or you want to define the threshold that fits your use case the best. Using the score displayed in the ranking can help you experiment. Now, let's take a quick look at the code so you know how it works overall. We will use the GPT cache library to handle the semantic cache mechanism. You can find GPT cache on GitHub and simply install it using pip. The library is super easy to use, so let's review quickly the official example. There are two key modules to import, cache from GPT cache and OpenAI from GPT cache adapters. Then you simply init the cache and the OpenAI API key. It will pick it up from the environment variables. And that's it. You have nothing else to do. Now, as you use the OpenAI module, it will automatically use the cache and avoid repeating API calls for queries that are similar. The library integrates with many tools to build AI-powered workflows like Langchain, Llama Index, OpenAI, and more. Let's start to look at the Cache Evaluator class that we use to handle both the ONNX and OpenAI-based semantic caches. First, let's quickly go through the imported modules. Here, the important parts are the GPT cache imports, especially OneNX and OpenAI are used to compute the embeddings. The cache base and vector base hold the text and embeddings respectively. And the search distance evaluation is used to specify the distance function. Then we create the cache evaluator class and start with the constructor. We initialize the ONNX model and the OpenAI object used later to compute the embeddings for the cache. Then we create two data managers, one for the ONNX model 
and one using the OpenAI API for embeddings. For each of them, specify a cache base that will use SQLite to store the text of our queries in the cache. A vector base that will hold the embeddings. Here we use Face, a lightweight vector database built by Metcrit. Two helpers to clear the cache by deleting the SQLite and Face database from the disk and the reset function that first clears the cache and then reinitialize it. Again, you can take a look at the code for the web application in the GitHub repository. You can also simply build the code and run it locally to experiment with GPT cache. Then the most important part, the use cache context manager. We use a context manager to use a with statement in Python to execute code in the context of a specific cache, ONNX or OpenAI. It takes as an argument a mode that is either ONNX or OpenAI and based on the argument, we initialize the cache with the init function using the proper embedding function and data manager. In the try block, we yield, and in the finally block, we pass. But you can also call the reset method if you want to clear the cache after each use, for instance, for a different experiment. We use the try, yield, and finally keywords because it's the way you build a context manager with a function. Finally, we create two additional methods, add to cache and query. Add to cache computes the embedding and saves it to the current cache. We use the global cache object imported from GPT cache that holds the current initialized cache. The query function computes the embeddings for a query and retrieves the similarity with all the entries in the cache. Equipped with our cache evaluator, we can build the web application. I won't explain much here, but I used Streamlit a library to create simple web apps entirely in Python. First, to create a resource cache to hold our cache evaluator instance between reloads and avoid recreating it every time. Then we populate the cache as in the video example using the add to cache function. But first, we make sure to use our context manager to select the proper cache. We continue by computing the matches for OpenAI and ONNX using the query method. And finally, we display the results in the two columns. And tada! You get your semantic cache visualizer application. But we are not done yet, since you need an AI app in the first place to enjoy the benefits of semantic caching. To do so and have a walkthrough example, you can learn how to transform any website into a powerful chatbot by watching my video on the topic. Or if you want to dive more into semantic caching, you can look at my previous video. See you in the next one.